Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to our weekly Technologies of the Future webinar with live Q&A. This morning we are discussing the convergence of emotion and World Humanitarian Day and I am really looking forward to this one. I have a passage from a book this morning that is from the School of Life and Emotional Education and then I'll share a little bit about World Humanitarian Day and I'm actually right at the beginning and in the introduction. Modern societies are collectively deeply committed to education and have in place the mechanisms needed to teach every conceivable profession and to cover every topic of inquiry. We reliably educate pilots and neurosurgeons, actuaries and dental hygienists. We offer lessons in the irregularities of the French Pluperfect and textbooks on the conductive properties of metal alloys. We are not individually much cleverer than the average animal or heron or a mole but the knack of our species lies in our capacity to transmit our accumulated knowledge down the generations. The slowest among us can in a few hours pick up ideas that it took a few rare geniuses a lifetime to acquire. Yet what is distinctive is just how selective we are about the topics we deem it possible to educate ourselves in. Our energies are overwhelmingly directed towards material, scientific and technical subjects and away from psychological and emotional ones. Much anxiety surrounds the question of how good the next generation will be at maths, very little around their abilities at marriage or kindness. We devote inordinate hours to learning about tectonic plates and cloud formations and relatively few fathoming shame and rage. And... I will now just read the theme of World Humanitarian Day today. It is, it takes a village. And it is the purpose of today, the 19th of August, is to shine a light on the hundreds of thousands of volunteers, professionals, and crisis affected people who deliver urgent health care, shelter, food, protection, water, and much more. And um, when it, it shares on the website, whenever and wherever people are, in crisis there are others who help them from the affected people themselves always first to respond when disaster strikes to the global community that supports them as they recover they come together to ease suffering and bring hope because as the saying goes it takes a village to support people in crisis and with that I shall invite online my lovely experts this morning to have a conversation around this topic the Convergence of Emotion and World Humanitarian Day. I can see Christina, I can see Andrew, Brendan and Louis are joining us this morning. I feel Christina, like going good, good morning. I can, I can see you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. You. Good morning, Brendan. How are you? Oh, great. <laughs> it has been Wonderful a day. while. Good, good morning. Good morning, Andrew. All right. Good morning, Louis. Good morning, all. We're sitting in the dark. I am. I've just realised that one. <laughs> I will ask you all for a one-word opener this morning. Christina. Uh, um, tentative. Brendan. Uh, positive. Andrew. Enthusiastic. And Louis. Driven. Driven. Nice. I'm going to go with energetic today. It is Friday. I uh, have been up for meetings at 2.30 a.m. this morning and I am really excited about the day, actually. There's a lot of positive things happening and positive momentum. And I guess when we're talking about things like World Humanitarian Day, it just gives you contrast on your life and some of the big challenges that the world has and where we may fit in this overall scheme of things. So uh, let's kick into the conversation. I'd love to talk about the mindset of World Humanitarian Day and emotions and where what your thoughts are around maybe Australia, maybe international. Do you think many people know about World Humanitarian Day? What would you love the mindset to be? Where would you like to take this? <laughs> Andrew, I'm going to go to you first. This can get quite deep and philosophical <laughs> and sometimes a little bit divisive. Um, look, I, I think as a, as a, as a world, we, we have a long way to go. Uh, as, as humans, uh, we sometimes struggle with 
uh, things that aren't in our immediate group, our immediate tribe, um, even domestically or, or, or otherwise. Um, so I think there's a long way to go and uh, we're understanding human, human motivators, human emotions, the biology behind it so much better. The internet's driven, uh, broken down geographical barriers a lot more. Uh, I think the potential to, to help uh, in humanitarian crisis is more possible than it has been at, in any point in the past. Ooh. Dina? So there's people that will go, why do we need a World Humanitarian Day? Uh, and, I, and, and part of me goes, yes, why do we need to have a World Humanitarian Day? We should be treating other people as we want to be treated and, you know, that we should, we should be focused on equality and all these things. Uh, but I think when you do have something like a World Humanitarian Day or a World Environment Day, it actually pulls attention to some issues that potentially we don't know about. Uh, and we're working with a young group um, at, a, at a high school at the moment, and one of the um, young girls is from Pakistan, and she's actually bringing attention to an issue uh, and looking at it from three angles from a humanitarian perspective, but from the issue of the, the people at the centre of the controversy and the two nations on either side of it. So I think when we have things like World Humanitarian Day, we actually expand our knowledge and we potentially find out a lot about what is going on in the world that otherwise we wouldn't have heard about. Louis? Oh, look, I'm feeling a little out of the depth here, but I'll give it a crack. It's, how do I put this? Um, Let me refine a question for you. What's your thoughts on World Humanitarian Day? <laughs> um, that we just generally need to have a bit more awareness across the board everywhere for this, that sometimes we get a little lost in constant hunt for coin rather than actually trying to improve everyone. Someone who's already lost a little brother, like I understand the value of having family and having people that you really enjoy having around your company and then what it's like to miss that. So if more people were aware of that and less driven towards yeah coin pretty much i think just in general we'd have a happier more knowledgeable planet because everyone would just actually be a bit more creative and trying to help each other just seems how it is and sorry if that was a bit off but yeah look it's just i think sometimes it's when you're more focused on helping others, you end up just a more creative mind in general. And then life just becomes that bit happier. And I think it'd be cool if everyone was a bit more driven towards helping others. So yeah, that's me. Brendan? Um, I think it's got some hope there for you, Louis. Um, we've changed our government. And I think we've with that, we've changed our country. Um, it was a very, very mean-spirited uh, time. Uh, we've changed for a lot more positivity. Um, and you can see that in the US, where they're getting rid of some of the uh, crazier elements in politics. Um, uh, and you're saying with the, the UK as well, right? So there is hope. Um, so when we start focusing on people, people start focusing on other people as well, right? Um, because a lot of things that seemed impossible before. Um, and a lot of the structural issues as well, what the government does. Um, I know my rub some people the wrong way here, but my, my understanding is the fact that government needs to be a pivotal point in all these things because they're the only ones that got the, the unlimited budgets, the ability to mobilise, and also the ability to actually frame uh, the message or the vision for the future. And often politicians get that wrong, but I think that's the big power. If we got decent people in power with those big visions, then we can move heaven and earth, right? Yeah. And... Um, uh, some of those things that happen like with uh, humanitarian crisis and stuff like that, right? It's just, you just got to motivate the resources, right? You got you to mobilise those, right? I mean, we've already got the technology now to basically provide fresh, clean drinking water to everyone on earth. And I think they last cost is around about $10 billion a year, all right? So that's a lot of money, but compared to the whole world, 
it pales in comparison to anything else, right? Uh, we spend heaps more money <laughs> on weapons and things like that to kill people, right? So, so it's just a matter of perspective and what we can do. And we can make the world a lot safer by solving these issues that most people would think, oh, they're just humanitarian issues, they're people over there. But you see, if we treat all the people over there all nice and we make sure we uplift their lives, then they're less likely to attack us, less likely to be doing greed, there's less likely to promote corruption. Um, and then we solve our bigger issues, right? Now we've got more resources to help people as opposed to try to kill them. I love all of your perspectives on the mindset this morning. And I guess this is why I chose the topic to converge emotion and World Humanitarian Day, because uh, it does start at home. And I think there's a, a raising awareness. I love the idea of show up for yourself so you can show up for others. And I think we need to recognize what's happening in our worlds and be able to, you know, uh, look after ourselves and our immediate friends and family and local community and country and world and whatever it may be, but at the right time and at the right level. So everyone always has something going on in their world. And I like the the theory and I created a model around if you asked anyone to tell you seven problems, they could probably tell you seven problems and you get what you focus on. And so if you're actually thinking about yourself having seven problems and then your family members having seven problems and then your team members having seven problems, your local community all having seven problems, there's billions of problems in the world. And so if you're actually looking at it like that, it can be quite overwhelming. But then, you know, how do we actually look at it from a different angle of what are some of those biggest challenges and how do we actually... Um, allocate the percentage of our life that we want to put into work into something that's really meaningful and purposeful. And I think the world's going through this transition at the moment where people are caring a lot more. Um, they're also going through a period where there's a lot more talk about mental health and um, and violence at home and all sorts of different things. And so I think being able to compartmentalise those things and have a bit of contrast and like the book says about emotional intelligence and being able to have an emotional education it's you know how do we show up every day and then how do we be a leader to be able to then support those around us as well and know if they are in scarcity like you say Brendan if you've got whole countries in scarcity that's really dangerous and so um, you know the more people if you're thinking about it takes a village typically Hundreds of years ago, uh, maybe more thousands of years ago, a, vi a village would recognise when someone was not doing so well and the village would support that person. But you had way more positive and abundance um, people that were doing OK that would then bring those the rest along. So um, great topic for today. Christina, I can see you're about to jump in. And you've lost your audio because you are on mute. I'm on mute. Um, it's all a matter of perspective. And we all come to these things from our, from our own perspectives. And it's like this conversation with, the, with this young student yesterday. Um, it, it, we actually need to be able to put ourselves in the shoes of others. I don't think m most people don't go into a conflict. I'm not talking about global conflicts. Now I'm just talking about the conflicts that we, that we may have or where we, you know, as Brendan, you say, we all need to do something. It doesn't matter how little it is let's all contribute to a cause. There are so many of them we can select one to make a difference in. Uh, but it is a matter of perspective. Different people, but people think they're right. Um, and I think what goes with humanitarian and what we, what underlies all of that is a sense of fear. And this is Andrew where you said, maybe we'll get philosophical, I'm not sure. Um, but we need to eliminate that sense of ego to think that we have the only perspective that is correct. Uh, and we need to be able to view things from several different angles to then decide you know, for ourselves, uh, with as little judgment as we can. And I think it's actually impossible to have no judgment at all. Um, but what is it that we want to do? What is it that we want to contribute to? What, where do we sit? How do we balance something and say that's right or that's wrong? I think that's very, I mean, having people starve and having people die of thirst when, Brendan, as you just said, we can actually, you know, have enough water for a population. We know that if we can have clean water for a population, people can go to work, people can get educated. How do we balance all of that um, to, to have it fair and equitable? I think the stats are if we had everyone had clean water, 50% of the world's diseases would be eradicated. And so there's some pretty significant difference that can be made. 
And so I'd love to shift now into the technology part of the conversation. So, you know, what are some of those humanitarian efforts that we can shine a light on? What are some inventions? What are some people doing that's giving you all hope? Um, well, we've had water. Um, I remember seeing a documentary about maybe five or six years ago where they were turning coffee grounds from uh, coffee, uh, you know, uh, cafes and things like that. They just go into a landfill or wherever the hell they go to. Uh, but what they were doing is they were putting them, mixing with clay, right? They're putting it in a fire, um, which burns off all the coffee grounds and these little micropores in the clay, right? And then you've got a water filter which uh, basically is allowed to put into, the, uh, into a well and then basically we filter out all the, the particles. Um, so uh, these, these, these sort of technologies are cheap, right? Um, they're accessible, uh, especially to impoverished nations and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, we, we can fix this. I, mean, I think the first thing is that we just have to have the will. We have to have the hope because hope be, builds on other hope um, and, and inspires other people to actually take a chance. And I think Gene Roddenberry said that, like in the Star Trek universe with the replicators, right? And this is where our singularity can be going to, is he says, uh, you know, once you've got that, you've got no hunger, you've got no greed, and all the children can read, right? And, and it's that, that's the idea that with this super abundance that we could do with all this technology and automation and things like that. But the most important thing, and I keep saying this all the time, is the safeguards and automation and the safeguards on uh, this technological singularity that we really aspire to is the fact that they make sure that the greedy people don't get control of the technology. Otherwise, we just lead ourselves into this dystopia. If we can make sure that that technology can be used for everybody and uh, freed up and democratization and demonetization of technology, then we have a super abundance and everyone can be happy. Yeah, I, I want to sort of shift and at, at some point we'll come back to just blockchain and how Web3 technologies are actually decentralizing the world and providing a lot more fair uh, access. But I actually want to shift, we've gone from water, I want to shift to food. And Louis, you're working on securing the world's food supply. Uh, where do you see it going in humanitarian efforts? In humanitarian efforts, honestly, I'd love to see more efforts towards education of better farming technologies, how to move away from dependence on fertilizers and pesticides and fungicides and things like that. Because with the amount of research popping out at the moment, showing things like cancers popping up from just simple things like pesticides, I mean, it's horrible. So what Brendan was just saying a moment ago about stopping the, uh, how do I, they're just basically the stealing of the technology and allowing them to only utilize it is something that really needs to be focused on and something and a reason why more people need to be educated on just simple technologies like uh, there's been a fungi in the ground for a little on a billion years and within the last hundred we've pretty much managed to wipe it out and it's what gave birth to our grass, our trees. It's what allows resources to be accessed in the soil. It allows us to move away from dependence on fertilizers. It gives us access to moisture in the ground that we just never had. Pops carbon into the soil, yet it's something that is almost never talked about. And mycorrhizae is something huge and something that could change the game for pretty much most of the planet. And it's just a simple thing that once more farmers and more people are aware of it, it's going to pretty much just change the game everywhere. And then uh, there was another tech as well, uh, just ducking back to uh, water here and how that can pair into food. Uh, there was a simple thing of adding just a bubble stream in a river and it helps clear out the plastic. And at the moment, there's technologies that are working towards turning plastic into edible food. And I mean, at that point, we're not going to have global hunger anywhere. Uh, it's just bloody awesome. So these are the texts that are popping through and stuff that I'm really interested in. So we'll wait and see where it goes. But if everything turns out nicely, we are going to have a really different, different planet within the next 10 to 15 years. And I think we're going to have a lot more happy people. 
So. Do you know, it also reminded me, Louis, just very briefly, is that it's not only what, what the technology that we create is, it's what the technology allows us to investigate, to find out about the fungi and things like that. So it's not only the end result where we create something that is a, a tech product that's going to, you know, turn plastic into food, but it's also the ability to know more and to share more knowledge. I think it's really important with humanitarianism, especially. Definitely. I've just put a quick plug into your website uh, in the chat here, Louis, and so um, just to Thanks. shout it out so anyone can check out nwaa.com.au, I believe it is, and um, and see the products that you're working on. Cheers. I want to actually shift into shine the light uh, for the humanitarian efforts that individuals are doing and I guess the impact that individuals are doing. And so today shining the light on first responders and, you know, the people who are actually planning and on the front line when disaster hits or going out and um, doing a lot of these humanitarian, humanitarian efforts on the ground. So I'd love to just sort of share the impact that they have and really give them a, um, you know, a spotlight on how grateful we are for them and you know, what are some of those stories of people that you've seen out there and what they're doing. I'm just going to mention my Boba's Promise um, and Aminata's um, fund for birthing mothers in Sierra Leone, where the death rate for a mother in childbirth is something like one in seven. Uh, and their population is very similar to Australia. So she's doing remarkable work um, humanitarian wise, bringing aid to, to pregnant women um, in Sierra Leone. And also my Boba, who is feeding thousands of people in Afghanistan, has a school in Afghanistan, is supporting orphans that, that are coming over, particularly um, young females. So all, you know, single people that have started a movement that are doing remarkable work uh, and have gathered communities around them to help them and are helping thousands. Yeah, I think um, the pandemic as well as really highlighted just those frontline workers and how dependent we are when, when, disaster did strike in the last couple of years you had a lot of people at risk you had doctors you had nurses you had people still there to help humanity move forward and this is you know in worldwide um it's, it's not just in developing nations where some of the humanitarian efforts were previously focused it was the people that still went to work and in the grocery stores and and all the rest so i think we really um felt how dependent we are on um, you know what humans need and the people that are actually out there and I hope that they're feeling appreciated as as much as they should. Well, I think more needs to be done to support those people though um, because often those people are not doing very well at all and they're not getting much support and they are really the, the people that keep our society together. Uh, teachers, nurses, doctors, uh, you know, firefighters, you know, all, all of the first responders and stuff like that. They're never, ever given enough. And uh, I think that really needs to change um, because, you know, when disaster strikes, you know, heaven forbid, you're the one that needs to rely on one of those people uh, and they're tired and they're exhausted and, um, yeah, they can't necessarily do their jobs unless they're looked after. And so we really need to put more effort into uh, elevating those people and giving them the resources they need. Yeah, Brendan, I'm going to take the opportunity now to talk about blockchain and Web3 mm -hmm. technologies, because I think there is an opportunity there to be able to reward people in different ways and really appreciate them. So um, there's a couple of things that I'm excited about. And I'm going to mention the creative arts, because I think just some of that for mental health and through COVID, I remember people singing from balconies and, you know, a lot of the artists were doing concerts and whatnot. And, you know, there's ways now that, you know, the creative arts isn't paid fair compared to, um, you know, what they could be. And so being able to be in this new builder and creator economy, we're looking at um, democratising and decentralising and really empowering people in Africa who are creating music and have a great story from Barbados where someone in Barbados was able to create a song and then launch it onto uh, the blockchain and sell his song for a hundred thousand dollars, which would have been two years worth of Spotify income for him. Um, and if that, so, you know, being able to shift the way that that's done. And when you were mentioning teachers, this is where it sort of come up for me. It's how do you actually um, have 
the reward, let's say that you're teaching a student throughout their life, let's say year four to year six, I was watching this uh, little YouTube this morning about it's the most creative time for kids to invent things. So let's say you're teaching kids to invent things and you get like a small token, tokenized contribution to their inventions or to their future or the way that you've educated them. And then, you know, they end up being Einstein or someone who's, you know, quite well rewarded in the future that you had a piece and a little bit of a reward for the part that you've taken in their life along the way. So I, I don't know, I think um, there's, there's a lot of space to be able to redesign the way that the infrastructure of the world works. I think you're being psychic, Lisa. I actually interviewed a group yesterday um, for Inspired for Impact, Genus, they're called, and they're working with 40, 40 Year 6. Um, they've gamified uh, invention, creativity, uh, et cetera. So they're, they're doing it almost exactly what you just said. Um, and they're starting with that four to six year old age bracket and then hoping to, to extend it either way. And they're working with schools globally. So it'll be quite amazing to, to see um, where they go with their app. And we'll have to uh, share the link to that podcast as well. Um, we are almost at time. So Andrew, please jump in and then we'll start to- Yeah, don't no worry. Look, I think something that's uh, hugely underappreciated and having uh, the, the rewards to, to encourage this emotional behavior is compassion. Um, there's, a, there's a really nice book um, called Into the Magic Shop by a, a US neuroscientist that, that shows how important compassion is both to building uh, uh, um, the altruism that helps us come together to solve things, but also it uh, improves our own physical and psychological well-being. We should be encouraging uh, a lot more compassion at that at that early age, uh, and I think that will go a long way to uh, get mobilising people to encourage um, support in humanitarian crisis. Beautiful. Alrighty, I'm going to ask you each a vision for the future. So the question is, it's 20 years in the future, 2042, you've just woken up based on the convergence of emotion and humanitarian efforts. What does the world look like? Brendan. My hope is to look like Star Trek. <laughs> because, because in that world, I mean, practically you've eliminated hunger, disease, yeah. uh, everyone is, you know, educated and, and they literally just fly around in space because they've got nothing else better to do. Like, like it's, it's great. Like, uh, uh, I know I know that the, the whole idea of they, they have all these wars and stuff like that in, in Star Trek universe, but basically it's all about the abundance. That's why they can go out and become explorers because their world's needs are met. And I think that's something we can aspire to, um, uh, where we can make sure everyone is... Uh, been able to do whatever they want to pursue. Great, Andrew. I think that um, it's it's a world where the question of the basic necessities is is no longer questioned. People, are, there's no food insecurity, uh, safety safety concerns. Um, the the idea of a humanitarian crisis, or which then turns into refugee crisis, are things that are that are in history. Uh, technology is there not to drive revenues, but to dr to drive a beneficial outcome for, for the world and, and the way that we live. Louis? Oh, 20 years time. Um, I'd like to get up and feel a bit more like I did when I was a kid, where things were just uh, a bit more accessible. Food was a bit tastier. Water was a bit nicer. And the wars didn't seem as much and I mean dad's just come at me with this if we want a better world change the media from disinformation and division to empathetic and truthfulness and I mean I think that's pretty much bang on point that just a little bit of yeah better media we actually might start seeing a bit better world I love it we'll continue these conversations for sure Christina uh, all the sustainable development goals have been met. Uh, we do live in a utopian society. Nobody's hungry, nobody's thirsty. Everyone's got access to clean water. We have time to do work from our skill sets. Uh, we share our perspectives. We don't necessarily have to agree with everybody. It is perfectly fine to agree 
to disagree and ego has taken a very far back seat. That's my utopian vision for 20 years into the future. I love it. For me, I think we're a lot more emotionally aware, uh, emotionally educated. We're able to synthesize the positive and the negative and move forward on things that are meaningful. And most companies and businesses and the government, they're all channeling their efforts towards things with purpose so that we can have this utopian vision and future that you all speak of. And with that, I shall wrap us up today. I am going to have a shout out and say happy birthday to Hayley. Happy, happy birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to celebrating with you happy online. Birthday, uh, maybe you've had a little delivery at your door by now. Maybe you haven't. Uh, we shall see. And I want to have a huge thank you for you all for joining this morning, especially with a topic such as this, to be able to raise some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that the world has. So thank you, Louis. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone who's joined us here live online and in our online learning community. Have a wonderful Friday. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Cheers.